my Bill for Thousand Nation. How's everyone doing today? Hopefully, everyone's having a great day. If not, I hope it gets better from here. We are back with another Mr. Ballin video. This one is titled, The Devouring Mother. Top three photos with disturbing backstories, part one. All right, I'm excited for today's video. If you guys are excited as I am, go ahead, turn them lights down low, put on something comfy cup, something special. Let's get slightly disturbed. Today, I'm gonna to share with you three progressively more horrifying true stories, and at the end of each of them, I'm gonna share with you the picture that is famously associated with them. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place, because that's all I do, and I upload three, four, even five times every Old week. Old videos. So if that's of interest to you, then please remove one puzzle piece from all of the like button's puzzles. Also, subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Oh my god, that would make my brain fizzle if every puzzle I ever had just had one piece missing out of it. I would not be able to do that. In 1909, Loana Constantinescu was a 27-year-old woman living in the Romanian city of Timișoara. Loana was a devout practitioner of Zoroastrianism, which is one of the world's oldest organized religions that began in ancient Persia and is now practiced primarily in East Asia. In the city that Loana was living in, okay. it was majority Christian, and they looked at Zoroastrians as witches. As really? such, Loana was persecuted and oh, ostracized primarily by these two. That's sad, and it kind of makes me feel bad. It is... Look, like I say, I say it all the time. I don't care what anyone believes in as long as it's good for them. As long, you know what I mean? And as long as it's something that helps them get through this life, you know? Man, this let people be. Christian ministers that spread a rumor that she was drinking the blood of local children and that she worshipped Satan. That rumor would spread and grow to the point where everybody knew Loana as like the singular witch of all the Zoroastrians in the city, and it ultimately incited this angry Christian mob to storm her house Darn on feathers. October 21st, 1909, and rip her into the streets and savagely beat her to within an inch of her life. She would survive this lynching and she would be taken to a hospital where she'd be treated for severe blunt force injuries and lacerations. But after two days of being in the hospital, when she had not made a full recovery at all, she checked herself out and headed home. The next day, Loana was found dead in her apartment and her family and friends initially believed that she had died as a result of the injuries she had sustained from the angry mob and that perhaps she had checked herself out of the hospital too soon and untreated, that's why she must have yeah. passed away early. But when the authorities arrived at her house and began looking at the scene, it did not look like she had died as a result of those injuries. It looked more like some sort of ritual suicide. She was laying on this sofa with her arms over her chest. Next to the sofa was an altar that was adorned with strange occult symbols and ritual herbs and effigies. And on the altar was this goblet with deep, dark red stains on the inside. When they looked at Loana, even though she was fully dressed, underneath her sleeves were all these cuts on her arms and there were cuts on her legs as well. After her autopsy, the medical examiner said she had died from a combination of blood loss and internal shock from ingesting massive quantities of blood that triggered cardiac arrest. Luana had been draining her own blood into the sacramental goblet drinking it and then doing it over and over again until she died. Locals believed that that was not just a ritual suicide, but rather she was placing a curse on her enemies. Almost immediately following her death, those two Christian ministers that had spread those rumors about her that led to the mob coming and attacking her, mm -hmm. they both died of an extremely rare bloodborne illness. And then immediately following their demise, the two primary vigilantes that actually organized that mob that would attack Loana, they both died. One was hit by a falling tree and another died in a fire. And according to more recent accounts, Loana's curse didn't end with the death of her tormentors. There have been dozens of reports oh. of people after seeing this image, which is of Loana after she was discovered by authorities in her home, that they will have bouts of extreme sleep paralysis. These are people that have never had sleep paralysis before, that this picture somehow induces sleep paralysis in them, like they're cursed by Luana. 
And so now that you've seen really? this image, you're cursed too. So Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Ballin. That's my buddy right there. Only In real friends curse Blanche you. Blanche Monnier was a beautiful 25-year-old from a very wealthy, prominent family in Paris who desperately wanted to find a husband and move out of her mother's home and start her own life. The man she would fall in love with was not a young, rich aristocrat like her family was hoping, but instead was an older, poor lawyer. Her mother told her that she needed to break off this relationship and find a more suitable suitor. But Blanche refused and said she was in love with this man. When her mother outright forbid her from seeing this man ever again, she refused and began sneaking out at night to spend time with this guy and was away from the home quite a bit, just kind of escaping her mom. But during this tumultuous time where Blanche is very much at odds with her mother, Blanche would unexpectedly die. And since this is the late 1800s, people did that at a young age. They just unexpectedly <laughs> died. And so her lover yeah. and her family and society mourned her loss, but ultimately time went on and people moved on. 25 years later in 1901, French police received this strange handwritten letter that just basically states that the Monnier family has a very dirty secret and you should go check their estate out. Now the Monnier family was an excellent standing in Paris. I mean, they were one of the more prominent families. The mother, she was known for her charitable works. They were just one of those families that everybody knew, including certainly the French police. And so when they got this letter, they weren't actually that concerned that there was any truth to this letter, but they felt like it was their duty to at least go knock on the Monnier family's door, show them the letter, and then just take a look around. And so yeah. they did that. They showed up, they showed the Monnier family, including her mother who was at the door, hey, we have this letter, would you mind if we looked around? The Monnier family was very cooperative. They let them walk around their whole big estate and the police didn't find anything. As they're chatting in the doorway, getting ready to leave because this is all just a big misunderstanding, one of the officers turns and looks up a little flight of stairs that they hadn't gone up and notices a small door that's been padlocked shut. And it's the only door at the end of this one stairwell. And he says off the cuff to the family, well, what's in that door up there? And Blanche's mother says, oh, that's a supply closet. You know, our assistants come in and they'll go in there and use that. And the French police officers say, well, would you mind if we just poked our heads in? It's the only space we haven't checked. And since we're already here, we'll just check that box. We'll go in there and poke our heads in. At this point, the Monnier family says, no, we're not going to let you go in there because you don't need to. It's just, it's just a supply closet. Now the police say, you're going to go ahead and open up that door. At which point the family says, no, we're not. So one of the officers tells the family to stay right here while the other officer goes up the stairs to try to break open this lock and see what's in there. As soon as he's right outside the door, he's hit with this overwhelmingly disgusting smell. It smells like rotting flesh. It smells like death. He covers his mouth and he breaks open the lock and he opens the door and there in the middle of this dark, disgusting smelling room on a rotting straw mattress, is none other than Blanche Monnier. 25 years later, she is alive, she barely weighs 55 pounds, and she's chained to a bed. She has not come out of those chains or moved off of that bed in 25 years. The smell was so bad that could barely be in there for longer than a few minutes at a time, but one of the officers immediately goes over and knocks down some of the wood that was blocking up the windows, and sunlight pours into the room, and it's the first time Blanche Monnier is seeing sunlight in 25 years. The reason she had been imprisoned in this room is because 25 years earlier when she was fighting with her mother about not seeing this poor commoner, and she wasn't willing to break off the relationship with him, her mother told her to go in this room and said, you can't come out until you tell me you're gonna break it off with this guy. She was so in love with him that she said no, and her mother wouldn't let her leave. And then days turned into months, turned into years, turned into decades, and here we are 25 years later, and she had never left that room. The mother and the brother of Blanche Monnier were arrested, and the public found out about this, and it incited a huge mob that went to their house and it actually caused Blanche Monnier's mother to have a heart attack and she would end up dying only a couple of days later. And so she never had to serve Dang. any jail time or really answer to any of her crimes. And the brother was complicit in what was happening to Blanche Monnier, but he kind of weaseled his way out of it. As for Blanche Monnier, she was remarkably lucid when she came out of that room. And she commented on how lovely it was to breathe fresh air and to be in sunlight. She was brought to a hospital where she did make a recovery, but she was so screwed up from being in that room that she didn't really know how to function in society anymore. 
And so she was moved to a mental institution. And unfortunately, she died about 10 years later. That poor lady. That's fucking awful. On October 13th, wow. 1972, Uruguayan Flight 571 was flying from Uruguay to Chile for a rugby game. On board were 45 people. There was five pilots and crew. The other... I think I know this. I think I've heard this before, like, not, I think I've heard this before. 40 were the rugby team and their friends and relatives. <clears throat> so they take off and they're making their way to Chile and the pilot was relatively inexperienced and he made a fatal mistake. Hit he believed hill, right? it was time to Mountain. make their descent into Chile, but he was actually about 70 kilometers early. So as he's descending through the clouds, he believes he's gonna see a runway and land this plane. Instead, he sees the Andes Mountains, yeah. and it's too late to pull up out of the way. He basically nicked the mountain, causing the plane to start tumbling down at breakneck speeds, 350 kilometers per hour, as it's tumbling down the mountain, the tail breaks off and seven people are sucked out immediately that all perish. It's blazing down this mountain and then it comes to a crashing stop where on impact it kills the two pilots. But miraculously, of the 45 people on board, 33 were still alive when all the dust settled. But that night, five more people would perish from the freezing temperatures and within a couple days of this crash landing, another person would die. Those who were still alive that weren't in a coma or critically injured use luggage and debris from the plane and seats to create shelter. And they actually started pulling out lipstick from inside of some of the, the passengers' luggage. And they tried to write SOS on the outside of the plane because the fuselage was still pretty clearly intact, but they didn't have enough lipstick. They didn't have any medical supplies and they didn't have proper clothing for the temperatures they were in. They did not anticipate being in minus 30 degrees Celsius temperatures for extended periods of time. They also had very, very little food and it was running out very quickly. In a very yeah. cruel twist of fate, they actually found a working radio that allowed them to tune in and listen to the media as they tried to find them. And so they had to listen in horror after about a week when the search was called off because no one knew where they were and the assumption was they must have all died in the crash. When the food finally ran out, survivors began eating the seats inside the plane, the leather and the cotton. But as they're doing this, they know what the next step has to be if they're gonna survive. They need to Peoples. eat the dead. And so on day nine of the ordeal, the survivors ate Frozen the pilots. And they chose the pilots because they were the only people amongst the dead they didn't that know. they didn't personally know. The rest yeah. of the dead that they would ultimately eat were their friends and loved ones. Now, naturally, these people did not want to become cannibals, but virtually everyone out of a need to survive was able to make the adjustment. There were some people that couldn't, including one woman who didn't eat and ultimately died of starvation on day 60 because she just was not prepared to do what was necessary to survive. As if this situation wasn't bad enough, an avalanche would eventually strike the landing site, killing eight more of these people that are doing everything they can to survive. But at the time of the avalanche, their food source had effectively run out. And so those eight people who perished in the avalanche ultimately replenished their food source. From day one, the survivors discussed climbing up and over the mountains and walking towards Chile to try to search for help. But the attempt so far had all failed due to extreme cold, malnutrition, altitude sickness. It was like they knew as soon as they walked over that mountain, they were gonna die. And so many of them decided early on that they would rather just stay with the group because at least that way they would die as a group or maybe by some stroke of luck, they could still be discovered and they might be easier to discover as a big group. But two months after the crash, and with no help in sight, they know the search has been called off, two of the survivors basically say, screw it. I'm gonna make the trek over the Andes Mountains. We have no supplies, we have nothing, no map, no compass, no anything. We're just gonna walk roughly in the direction of Chile, and you know what, we're either gonna die here or we're gonna die out there. And so the two take off. Hell yeah. They somehow survived for nine days walking over the Andes Mountains with no equipment. They've been out for 60 plus days at this point, And they managed to walk into this valley 
and they see that there are people living in this valley. There's actually a couple of fishermen right on the other side of this river. And so they go down to the edge of the river and they're yelling out to these people on the other side. The fishermen couldn't make out what they were saying. And so the fishermen, they got a piece of paper and they put a pencil in it and balled it up with a rock and threw it across the river. And they were able to write down that they had survived a plane crash. They were located back in that direction. There was 14 other survivors and they desperately needed help, balled it up, threw it back. Three Chilean helicopters were spun up and sent off in their direction, and the 14 other survivors were able to be picked up, brought to safety, and all 16 would make a full physical recovery. However, Mentally. the most difficult thing they would ever have to recover from was becoming reluctant cannibals, which is something that haunts all of them to this day. And, he and here is the famous final picture of inside Uruguayan Flight 571, yeah. just moments before they crashed into the Andes Mountain, and had to go through that horrific 72 day ordeal. So that's gonna do it guys. Let me know in the comments what you thought of these three stories. It was great. I love the Minister Ball. Oh, that was a good one. I really enjoy it. I love the three partner ones. I do, I always have. All right, I really enjoyed today's video. If you all enjoyed today's video as much as I did, please go down there, leave a thumbs up. It really does help the channel grow. While you're down there, if you want, go on over and slap that subscribe button. Become part of the Bill for Thousand Nation. We do some crazy shit here. And if you want to know when that crazy shit happens, ding that bell. It might work for you. It might not. It probably won't. But if it do, jump on in on one of my premieres. Be like, hey, Bill, I just got danged. I've never heard a ding like that. I've never felt a ding like that. When you dinged me, it shook the whole house. I liked it. Leave a like and dip. That's all you got to do. As always, be good to one another. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Damn, Mr. Bone. Those are good, bud.